Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Sustaining Sustainability. I'm your host, C.B. Bhattacharya, Professor and Director of the Center for Sustainable Business at the University of Pittsburgh. This week, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined from Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt, by Gwenel Abis Huit, the Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer at Schneider Electric. At Schneider, she leads the development of strategic sustainability and quality initiatives while steering all the merger acquisitions and divestment activities. Schneider Electric is recognized as a global 100 most sustainable company with 180 years of innovation experience. In 2021, they were named the number one most sustainable corporation by Corporate Knights. And as of last year, they have provided over 4 million people with access to green electricity. Gwenelle, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, CB, for inviting me. Absolutely. We are delighted that you're here with us. So, Gwenelle, you are at COP27, and it's our privilege to interview you from, from there. So, as the summit comes to a close, what are your big takeaways from COP27? You know, your candid observations on the successes and the failures of the event. Well, you know, COP27 is a critical milestone for both the private sector and the public sector, both together. It's not only about the discussion, but more on accelerating cohesive and effective actions. And I think that the Egyptian government wanted this COP to be around implementation, about actions. And I think that's what we needed. So that's why we participated at Schneider Electric to contribute to this debate with policymakers, public leaders, civil societies, et cetera, because we need to accelerate the effort with concrete actions and removing the, bread, the roadblocks. So yes, I would say for me, it's very positive. There is a momentum there about actions, about implementation, about how to move forward. And for me, it's also a very good platform because you have all sectors, all parties, everybody all together trying to have the same mindset and to uh, share expertise, to share good practices. In terms of outcome, um, at the start of the COP, uh, we participated to an alliance of CEOs for climate leaders with an open letter uh, from the World Economic Forum. Uh, and I think it's also showing the importance of partnership between public and private sectors. It's not only like public discussions, but it's how we bridge the gap between the two and how we have a meaningful contribution. We also had uh, um, joined an action declaration pledge organized by corporate, play, uh, corporate nights. And again, it's all about you know how companies have a role in terms of commitment, but even in terms of uh, embarking uh, everyone along this journey. So just to show some actions that we were taking. And at the end of the day, we had a, a sustainability hub that we implemented. It's a big building with all solutions all together uh, just to showcase what's possible. And I think that the beauty of the COP is that we could have like seven ministers coming and having a show around what are the solutions to decarbonize. So I would say in the COP, it's not only discussion, it's what's behind the discussions. It's all the discussion around the corner where you could meet uh, numbers of policymakers, corporates, uh, NGOs, et cetera. And all together, we enter in journey where we want to make a difference. So that's basically what I retain from this COP. And uh, I think by comparison to the other COPs, two uh, different elements. The first one is that we were hearing the voices of the youth much uh, stronger than in the previous years. And I think that's very positive. We needed to have this kind of, you know, momentum from the youth in order to put pressure on the fact that in terms of negotiations, we have no time to lose anymore. Uh, but in addition to that, I would say this is the first COP focused not only on long-term negotiations, but on implementation, short-term solutions. The first time ever in ever COP that we have one day dedicated to solutions. We need to showcase the facts, not only big discussions, it's something real concrete that we need to deploy. We need to uh, raise awareness on what's going on and what's available in the market and deploying faster than we usually do. Sounds like you came away with a very positive kind of feeling and impression of, of the event. So tell us, how, how does attending COP27 
relate to your personal sense of purpose and the purpose of Schneider Electric? Well, you're right. I'm optimism because that's uh, that's where we, we, we can embark. But I would have to say that we are today in terms of commitment far away globally in achieving the limitation of the global warming to 1.5 degree scenarios. That's the reality today. All the pledges that have been done so far do not help the world to reach the 1.5 degree scenarios. We need to act three times faster and with three times more actions. So our conviction at Schneider Electric was to do that, we need to embark more people. We need to raise awareness. We need to bring back more people. And that was our intention at this COP. That's why we had this big sustainability hub building, just to showcase that it, it, there is no need to wait anymore. It's not like the technology was not available. On the contrary, we have everything in hands to uh, go back to the right trajectory. So I wouldn't say that everything was positive. I would say that I'm convinced that we have everything in hands if we are going and if we are looking in the same direction. We need to uh, bridge the gap and we, we need to collaborate with uh, our competitors, uh, the NGOs and other corporates and across the world value chains, et cetera, and, and, and spread the voice. That was our intention. You know, every every month that we lose is something that we will not be able to uh, cope with in the future. So time for action, time for solution, time for implementation. Very well put, very well put. And you talked about partnerships and, and, and partnering with competitors. And that brings to mind supply chains, uh, which are often the largest and last opportunity that companies, you know, focus on for their climate mitigation, adaptation, and, and rehabilitation strategies. So how is Schneider Electric partnering with companies to help them decarbonize their supply chains? You're absolutely right. Supply chain is the largest opportunities for companies to reduce emissions. It's not only you know, your scope one and two, so your direct and indirect emissions. It's across the whole value chain, and especially on the supply chain, the upstream. So working with your suppliers in order to have meaningful impact uh, and again, technologies exist today. We just need to engage with them. So at uh, Schneider Electric, we have taken a commitment to decarbonize uh, our 1,000 uh, top suppliers by 50% by 2025. We wanted to do that to showcase that it's possible. It's not easy because it's very numbers of smaller companies that don't necessarily have the right understanding and competencies and capacity building around energy transition, decarbonization, et cetera. And we wanted also to have this commitment very short term, like 2025 is tomorrow. But we wanted to do that to say that there is no time to lose again. We need to, to act. So that's what our commitment. So today we are engaged with our top 1000 suppliers to help them in their decarbonization journey. But we don't stop there. We want to have broader impact and therefore we work for the suppliers of our customers. Well, we're thinking that numbers of our customers that want themselves to decarbonize so we can help them build their decarbonization roadmap. But in their decarbonization roadmap, again, if they want to have meaningful impact, they have to work on this for scope three. So meaning, so that's what we are doing, for example, uh, with the top 13 uh, pharmaceutical industries worldwide, where they wanted to decarbonize their suppliers and the, uh, well, they asked us to support them in uh, their decarbonization journey. So again, here we are helping our customers to decarbonize their suppliers. Otherwise, I mean, we will restrict our perimeter and therefore it will be even more difficult to be in the 1.5 degree scenarios. And at the end of the day, for us, what's also very important is to be exemplary, exemplary in everything that we are doing. For example, in our facilities, we want to have our you know, factories like the top uh, with the top new technologies. We wanted to have all the right range of digital tools to enhance and control operations and showing productivity gains, energy innovations and achieving savings up to 30% so that we could showcase that on our own manufacturing plans, we could have solutions deployed in concrete outcomes. That's excellent. Um... It is, this is not only these partnerships. I've never heard before that you're, you're actually working, a company working with the customer suppliers. I mean, that's that's something really uh, new. Is there a business case for these partnerships or how does this help uh, provide e economic resilience? We consider 
ourselves as an impact company, meaning we want to have meaningful impact with all our stakeholders. Uh, in this example, um, the, the program is called Energize. It's the program with the pharmaceutical industries. You know, it's never easy because you have to convince uh, suppliers in going in direction of decarbonization. You have to do capacity building. You have to train them on what it means concretely. You have to give them all information in order for them to take the right decision. And they will have themselves to take the right decision. Uh, and uh, well, they have received uh, education from Schneider Electric on renewable energy procurement. Uh, it's a way to decarbonize, but to get access to what we call the PPS, the Publishers Agreement for Renewables, normally you are big. It's a very complex market and uh, it's for the big companies to access to it. Here, we are granting them access because we are orchestrating, you know, uh, providing advice, orchestrating the access to renewable energy procurement. So we are, um, we are in a way operating like a, a facilitator, but also a capacity building or trainers for them in order to get them some steps into the carbonization scenario. So you see, it's really about defining their journey but helping them to get access to something that they are not even aware today. Yeah, that, that, that's really insightful. Thank you for that. Uh, moving topics just a little bit to ESG, environmental, social, and governance, which you know, um, is, is like, seems to be the hot topic uh, in town. How do you think the private sector can use ESG measurement and reporting to help achieve their climate commitments? We truly believe that ESG measurement and reporting uh, becomes a must for private sector. And uh, I think it's a matter also of transparency and showing that what we're doing is very robust. We need a kind of overall framework and using the same methodology uh, across different companies. So it's measurable, it's comparable, it's transparent so that you know, it gives trust in what we're, what we're doing collectively. It matters a lot to communicate, to disclose on a quarterly basis what we are doing in terms of uh, ESG commitment. We have been doing that for the past 15 years because we wanted to build trust externally, but also to commit people internally, our teams internally on delivering those elements. That's why we, were, we wanted to show that we have, we grant, uh, same importance for financial quarterly results than also for ESG uh, quarterly results. We are showing attracting more investors uh, and showing that this is good for business. And it's also um, making sure that people internally, they are part of the game. I mean, this is for me in charge of sustainability, uh, the, the, the key priority, because this is not my journey. This is the journey of all the company all together with all the teams uh, and this is completely embedded now in our culture. Yeah, that brings to mind the idea of uh, sustainability ownership that I had proposed in my book. So if, if all of us pick up the baton and think of it's our planet and we, we all pitch in, then definitely we can make a faster transition um, to, to where we need to go. Which leads to my next question. And so, so what opportunities for quick wins do you see in this energy transition? Because we, because we all want quick wins and uh, that can energize our employees and not just in our own company, but you know, in, in the industry as a whole. Uh, excellent question. And I, I think that for this question, there are three responses and one immediate quick win. The three responses is that to deliver the energy transition we need uh, to green the energy production, so the, uh, the upstream part where we produce energy going towards more renewables, for example. This is one thing. Is it rapid? Well, it takes time. We need to do that right now, but it takes time because of permitting, etc. Second, we need to transition from thermal usage into electrification or electrical usage. For example, mobility to tra transition from thermal mobility to electrical mobility. Again, we need to do it absolutely right now, but it takes time to transform the world economy into electrification. Immediate quick win, energy efficiency. This is my third point. And I think for energy efficiency and all smart solutions, it is the quick wins for business and planet in the energy transition that can happen right away. But I think that in the middle of the energy crisis that we're seeing, 
what a question, for example, in Europe is how to cope with the next winter. Well, for the next winter, we have to deploy faster uh, the energy efficiency measures, you know, buildings in total it, are accountable for around 40% of total CO2 emissions globally. So this is big deal. And uh, well, a way to reduce those emissions is to activate energy efficiency. And it can be done quite easily by deploying digital, you know, real data uh, that could be collected real time on a building and understanding on this basis the energy consumption and the carbon emissions. On this basis, deploying machine learning, artificial intelligence, in order to save energy, uh, the, the type of building, et cetera, we can, we can save up to 15 to 50 to 50% of annual energy spending. The only question is that people may not think immediately about energy efficiency because it's all about digital and digital, it's invisible. And sometimes it's easier to think about renewables, something material, but we have to think about digital as an option and we have to make visible what's invisible. Digital in energy efficiency is the key enabler immediately to have a real impact on the energy transition. Fascinating stuff. And we could go on talking for a long time. One final question. What call to action would you make to our listeners? We need to think how to have meaningful impact. Meaningful impact is broader impact than just our own system, wall ecosystem, having, you know, embarking more people in this journey. For me, we will we remove the needle only if we partner uh, globally uh, with the private sector, public sector, NGOs, etc., building new alliances and raising the voice. It's now that we have to make a difference if we want to get back on track. We don't have to wait and we cannot wait for up to 2050. It's now more than ever. Very well said. Uh, Gwenel, thank you so much for spending some of your very precious time uh, from Egypt today. Thank you, CB, with pleasure. And before I sign off, I do want to say this podcast is made possible with the help of my colleagues, Chris Gassman, who is Senior Associate Director at the Center for Sustainable Business, Christian P. Ahern, Center Program Manager, and Gabby Pogel, a Digital Marketing Specialist with the Center. I am your host, C.B. Bhattacharya, and I hope to see you in a couple of weeks for another edition of Sustaining Sustainability. Be sure to check out all of our past episodes on our website, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Give us a follow, leave a rating or review, and recommend an episode to a friend or colleague. All of these things help us in our mission to galvanize businesses to thrive for all stakeholders.